So good afternoon and welcome back to CIJ Summer. Um, in December 2017, Wa a journalist in Myanmar for Reuters, was arrested with his colleague while reporting on military abuses of the Rohingya people. Their ordeal included 18 months in prison and for their investigation, they were awarded the Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting in 2019. Wallone joins us from Toronto, where he's currently based and still work, working for Reuters. First of all, thank you very much for, for, um, for making time for us, Wallone, and for agreeing to give this year's Gavin McFadden lecture. Now, we say lecture, but some of the best reporters are not really given to lecturing. Um, and instead, we often prefer an informal conversation. Perhaps I could ask you to start, though, Wallone. I understand you'd like to make a short statement before before we go on. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Um, I'd like to th thank you for everyone uh, who invited me to try here. And I'm very grateful and very honored to be here. First, I, I want to step my uh, quick bios that I was born and raised in Myanmar, as uh, James introduced me. Uh, uh, in 2011, I started began working as a journalist for uh, journalists. Um, now, currently, I am in Toronto and I'm working for Reuters, um, primarily reporting on the current Myanmar political crisis. Uh, so today, I would like to talk about my experience as a journalist in. In Myanmar. Um, I, I, I like to begin with the introduction on Myanmar. I'm sure many of your listeners today are knowledgeable about the country. However, many people stay um, do not know much about because we were isolated from outside world during long decades of military rule. Um, uh, for decades, Myanmar was ruled by a repressive military government that controlled all the forces facets of our lives. Um, during this time, uh, thousands of the pro-democracy activists were thrown in jail for resisting the military dictatorship. Um, this was uh, Myanmar where I, I, I grew up. And then 20, 2010, I became, a, it, Myanmar became open up and I decided I, I wanted to be a journalist and I feel strongly that being a journalist is one of the most important jobs in the country, undergoing a transition to a more open society. And I began working as an intern uh, journalist as the People's Aid uh, local newspapers focused on the politics. Then I worked for the Myanmar Times as a political correspondent uh, for, uh, for nearly four years. In 2016, I joined Reuters. Um, uh, the, the new it, since that time the new uh, quasi uh, government uh, offers some political freedom such as easy media censorship in 2011 I really uh, it released political prisoners uh, including Nobel laureate Austin Suchi who had been under house arrest for 18 uh, 18 years then the international community um, were praise the new government reform, which increasing debate about the how engaged with the opening Myanmar's. In, in 2015, uh, the civilian government, uh, also so she became, uh, uh, she got power. So the, as the society opened up and ethnic and religious violence erupted, um, some of the other region, uh, like uh, autonomous region uh, in the North and uh, ethnic rebels group, uh, Clash at Myanmar military at that time. And then uh, in 2017, uh, in Rakhine State, uh, Buddhist uh, extremists targeted a Muslim, became a Rohingya crisis. So hundreds uh, died in communal clashes. And, and I was focused uh, for writers uh, reporting on the Rohingya crisis at that time. And so, let me uh, talk about a little bit brief on my reporting trip um, about Indian massacre, what I found uh, in October uh, in, in 2017, I, I, I traveled to Rakhine State um, 
for multiple times. Uh, sometimes uh, I, I, I secretly uh, went there for my reporting and, and uh, with my fellow Reuters reporters. So we got a we got a tip of ten Rohingya Muslim men um, points had been massacred by the soldiers resident in the village of Indian. Uh, so we were told that their bodies had been dumped in a mass grave uh, near the near the hill. So we crawled around uh, we crawled around the area in the bushes searching for grave, and we were terrified and fearful that soldiers down might be loaded. This, like uh, spot ads. So when we found a shallow grave, um, there were bones sticking out of the ground. The smell was sickening. And during the trip, I received two photos of the Rohingya Muslim uh, uh, who were tied up before they were shot and hacked to death. And a few weeks later, um, returning to Yangon, I managed to get another picture. Uh, the, the one showed the mutilated body in the shallow grave. Uh, that, then I said about tracking down the policeman who appear in, 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 in one of the pictures using the social media and to find them. And then I, I saw that all I managed to uh, investigate about how police uh, forces were involved in the police and security forces were involved in the case. Um, and I closed, in, I, I closed my, my reporting, finishing my reporting and uh, on December 12, I got a phone call from the policeman. I mean, those the, the police. I've been trying to get interview many of them uh, for 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 a month, um, and and then I they said like they want to get interview uh, uh, of the record interview to meet. So we, uh, my, me and my colleague went to those area uh, their station and waiting them for the interview. At that evening, uh, they handed me uh, when well, during the meeting we interview about them, and they handed me newspaper with the, some important papers inside. They told me, and then we took it. Uh, uh, when we left the restaurant um, uh, where we meet, the group of people group of people were pounced on me and like they arrested. Um, it was a setup. We learned later uh, after during the trials and police uh, accounts. So we, we, I was hooded and Fabrice said pull over my head. And after a short ride, like carrier, uh, they, I, they carry me um, from MPIC and to a police station, like for two weeks interrogation, um, uh, and especially they interrogated as about our stories, but how we are reporting. And um, at that time, I. I, I, I finished, already finished my reporting. Um, so I asked Reuters to publish uh, the story. I demanded from my, so Reuters never deter uh, uh, that they publish the story because I think we, it is very important. Um, it, it's very important um, for us to tell the truth that the world should know about it. So this is a uh, brief about my experience and I, I, I will let you uh, ask a question. Thank you Thank so you. much for that. Thank you so much for that. Well, um, that covers that covers most of my introductory questions anyway. Um, I wanted to ask you though, maybe you could talk or tell us a little bit about your time in Insean prison. Um, what was that like? Did you have any contact um, with the outside world when you were there? Yeah, in, in Insean uh, prison, I, I was about like everybody know five hundred and eleven days. Um, um, we uh, we were allowed to meet family like uh, two three days in a week, and my wife uh, she came to see me, and she she's allowed she she was allowed to bring uh, foods and for me at the time. Um, so the prison life, of course, it it was not really. Um, Comfortable, but I was uh, I I was placed in a cell uh, like a, uh, I I'm I was allowed to be individual cells. So so in the prison time, I managed to um, I managed my time for reading and, and growing uh, flowers or, or watering the vegetable in front of the, my cell, and then 
I was locked up like uh, six, 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning in the cell being alone. So yeah, that's prison time. So I, I wanted to say like all the time during the prison, I, I, I you know, I can, I, I, I hope with the positive that one day we're going to release and uh, I managed my time for reading and positive thinking that helped me to get through to it. Yeah. So you had two weeks of interrogation and then the rest of the time just in prison. Can I ask you one technical question, which might be of interest to investigative journalists, which is why did they take you to dinner if they wanted to arrest you? What was the nature of the setup? What did they want to achieve by taking you to dinner? Well, um, so, yes, um, after I came back from the Rakhine, I, I, I got a piece of evidence, you know, the, the, the massacre, we've been in the grave and, and I, I, on the way back to Yangon, I mean, in, in, in Rakhine, I, I met some police because we, we have to cross the checkpoint, you know, so they, um, they, they show me, um, they told me that uh, to sign on a book to, at the checkpoint in front of the Indian village. Um, and so I discovered, let me, let me a little bit of brief uh, about my experience before your question answering, you know. So um, I, I discussed with my bureau chief and how I should manage uh, to deal with those people. So, um, so I, I told, I cannot tell them, I couldn't tell them I'm a journalist. So I told them I'm a school teacher and I made friends with them and I asked their phone numbers uh, because just in case I need uh, to, um, uh, uh, to contact them for help or something like that. And so they, they look friendly and then they gave me some phone numbers. And then I came back to Yango and I started uh, uh, working on that. So. At that time, I also asked uh, another phone numbers to the local village chiefs, like potential police officer there, so uh, who might be there. So they provided me as multiple phone numbers, and I searched on the Facebook and social media account with that phone number. So mostly, I understand that people are using their phone numbers um, linked with the their Facebook accounts. So I tracked them down. So I got the list of police who were. Uh, I got a lot of pictures on the social media where they post that time and. I know who um, the, the, the name and their pictures of the police, so where are they from? So I, I call them, uh, I make appointments. So uh, before I got the interview that like, I, I got like six or seven police officers already interviewed. So, so because I wanted to get a lot of information, what happened really happened there. I wanted to make sure what the nature, what, the, what, what happened, how they're, uh, experience. Basically, I couldn't, if, I cannot ask, of course, did you kill them? But uh, I can ask about what is your experience, that kind of uh, interview. I never told them, like, I, we found that kind of stuff and, you know, but we, I collect information as much as I could. And then I, I, I know these, these, these person are on the, in front of, I mean, on the back of the people who tied up, you know, uh, so I, I showed them, do you know him? Uh, the, one of the police I met, um, luckily that time, uh, the Pope Francis trip to Yangon. So the battalion aide uh, who linked with the murder, uh, linked with the massacre situation, uh, they were in front of Reuters office. So I showed them, do you know these guys? And so they told me the name and phone number they also provided. That how I um, interviewed the people uh, police, so they aware they aware of something. Maybe they know or they already know that something righteous know about it and righteous investigating about it. So, uh, so before they make a setup, um, they make a, a final I mean, arrest. That they also call me at night, like ten o'clock at night. Oh, we went to we went to you can because I request them. I want to meet them. So they said you can meet us and you know. Uh, at 10 o'clock, my wife said, you, you shouldn't go at that time. It's, it's too late. And so I asked another college, uh, they, are, they were not also free that, so that I make it cancel that time. And then another police also, uh, I requested. So this is a, these are like two different cases. I, I suspect that they are already planned. Um, they said, oh yeah, Wallon, uh, 
you you can meet us now. Um, we are I'm moving to another place. If you cannot come um, this time, and you know you you cannot meet, you cannot have a chance. So I was. I, I finishing up my reporting. I'm, I have enough information to produce a story, but I still want to get more and more solid evidence, or you know, like police uh, the, the information from people who were on the ground. That how I yeah. Okay, okay, and of course we know, as we know, and um, more recently there's been a there's been a coup in Myanmar on February the first this year. How do you think that's changed things for journalists there? I mean, you're not there at the moment, but I imagine freedom from maneuver um, for press has gotten much worse. So in what way do you think that coup and the media crackdown um, is shaping how Myanmar journalists currently report the news and, and their approach to stories? So um, just, just like, um, I mean, Myanmar is like freedom, many places uh, around the world, um, Myanmar has been challenged and the ability of journalists to report without threat or hand whenever they are uh, crucial uh, to open democracy. I mean, um, current um, situation in Myanmar, many of my, uh, my, my friends who, you know, they cannot stay at their home and they were, like, some of them were fled to the other place, you know, because of the military uh, arrested, uh, trying to arrest them. Now, like some of the journalists has been released uh, recently, uh, but there's so many journalists still remain, mostly local reporters, including one of the, uh, I, I know some of the people, who, foreign journalists as well. So it's, it's difficult, but um, as, as I'm also doing reporting currently. So Richard's, um, I mean, we can, we can, uh, we can gather uh, information from the source, and we can we can get uh, like a, you know for the reporting what we need. But it's 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 risky. I am sure I can say that it's very it's not for safe for journalists. I mean, some people told me that uh, I mean, the prominent journalists on the ground they said like we can't even go out like as a journalist, just like uh, you know pretend other like a normal citizen, uh, you know local people, that how they're dealing with the kind of situation. So I have a follow-up question to that from, from Gwen Robinson, who's our mutual friend who put us in touch. And as you know, she's a former FT journalist who, who's also covered Myanmar. I, and I was talking to Gwen and her theory is that the situation in, in Myanmar is in some ways sending the country back to a kind of pre-digital analog age. What she sees um, there is the proliferation of, of, of little um, hand-produced mini newspapers or information sheets, even the revival of use, people using SMS um, for news bulletins, even the increasing use of FM radio and shortwave. But she also sees the increasing use of social media and a big information war there. So there, she sees two different um, and very almost contradictory trends in terms of Myanmar media. Does that does any of that ring true with you or make sense? Um, sorry, uh, can you can you make a little bit more uh, your question? Uh, yeah, uh, what, what Gwen was talking about was the fact that it seems like because of fear, many people and journalists are turning their back on digital um, uh, me media and, and returning to um, old fashioned information sheets. Um, and using FM radio and using SMS to send news bulletins around. So in other words, almost turning your back on technology to keep yourself sane. But then at the same time, we see a lot of information on social media. Um, and it seems like there are two different things happening there. Increasing use of, of, of new media, but also people going back to information sheets and paper and SMS to keep themselves safe. Yeah, um, I mean, basically, uh, I'm not very uh, involved in the technical situation about the SMS or things. <clears throat> Current situation, uh, everybody knows that um, local media, the, the military regime stopped their publishing license. Uh, so like a DVV and ARD, the prominent like, newspapers, I mean, uh, uh, shut, shut, they, they were like, shut down so and then as uh, some of the newspapers still publishing they're also 
you know, the military can uh, trouble them anytime. So that situation change. Let's, uh, before the coup, uh, there's uh, so many newspapers publishing every day and days by the papers, or they can, they can you know, people uh, open their office in Yangon somewhere else. Now, like, uh, there's a potentially risk by the military coup. Of course, um, some of the news agency has been, uh, you know, the military uh, raided, arrest them, and that sort of thing that daily days, uh, daily every every day is happening in Myanmar. So, I I'm, I I cannot tell much about details of how they are operating in Myanmar by the another analog or digital um, publication, but there's a definitely changing from the previous situation. Do you have any sense, Walon, of what kind of surveillance technology the government has? Can they check your Facebook? Can they check your SMS? Or how do they control and follow and, and, and um, check journalists? Are they very sophisticated? It's a good question. Um, I'm sure they might have some kind of uh, technologies to. Um, to, you know, to do their, I mean, they, they are trying to, I mean, they were, they were not hesitant. Uh, some, someone they think like, you know, they think like some of the journalists who can trouble them, they were hand them down like me, you know? So um, as my experience, um, I'm not sure how, how technology they have, how sophisticated, but definitely they have their own uh, civilian system and, you know, there, there's uh, intelligence uh, people who are, who are always looking for journalists. I mean, especially who can write about, uh, you know, what they're violating uh, laws and human rights situation. They will not hesitate that, I'm sure. Okay, if anybody has any questions for Walon in the audience, please do write them in, in the chat um, or in the Q&A. Um, and, and I will um, I will ask them. Um, one more question before I finish. I was going to ask you um, at this point um, ab about how you find time to write children's stories as well as investigative journalism. But then I read about you and I realized that I, actually you had a lot of time because you were in prison. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about the, the book that you, the children's book that you wrote there called JJ the Journalist because it sounds very relevant in a way to, to what we're about. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question, James. Um, <clears throat> so I started working for the Children Book Production since uh, 2012 uh, with my another co-founder. We, we found, we, I'm, I'm a co-founder of the Death Story Project um, uh, with the, my English teachers and my another, my friends, uh, we are, we we founded a third story project Chat and Book with the uh, with our um, that story mean like we have we we are going to be uh, like a middle a third person or some or maybe we represent like a peace tolerance and diversity issues um, to uh, to teach the children in Myanmar. I mean, as I grew up in the military rules and a lot of story we have read uh, when I when we were young like snow. Uh, it's always like one side is good, one side is bad, but we wanted to create another uh, dimension, you know, like a teaching, um, uh, like a story for the, the new uh, society. We really hope it for the new, new society in Myanmar. We don't really want any conflict. We want to be, a, you know, uh, that's, that's become a children's story. So we uh, accepted a lot of uh, young, uh, young writers, uh, uh, children's story writers invite us as and producing a lot of books. So at that time we already published for uh, nearly uh, 200,000 copies. Uh, we we uh, distributed uh, across the country for free, um, people who cannot accept books. That that are my our project. But currently it's uh, COVID-19 and military coup situation, they are nearly stopped. Uh, sadly, but um, so that how I deal with the children story. That so in the prison, I yeah of course I have a lot of time and I so um, I wanted to write uh, 
Hassan story, uh, uh, you know. So I, I think the situation uh, is, you know, exactly what happened. And I, I wanted to write about a journalist that, that how it became a story. And before that, I also wrote another book about uh, the children's story, which is different from that time. So first, I, I wanted to teach children for like a, um, uh, like children need to be uh, inquisitive or, you know, they should ask any question or to the other. I was also accused that I'm a too much question when I was young, that a lot of people didn't really like that. But I, you know, that how I wanted to tell them I mean, there is no stupid question that they should ask. And that how I wanted to uh, encourage them uh, as a young reporter, where I, I'm also, I wasn't a reporter when I was young, but of course I, I created that time and, you know, encourage about how important of the reporting and how important of the question and inquisitive and finding it what happened situation, yeah. It sounds like a great book. Was that published in Myanmar? Yeah, uh, it published. Uh, I already has two uh, uh, two books. Um, uh, what JJ Second Boats also published a third story project. Yeah, in an English and Burmese version. Yeah. Ah, so there is an English version. Yeah, we would love to see that. That sounds perfect for the kind of thing that we that we would like to do. Um, there are a couple of questions from the audience. I will try and um, paraphrase. First of all. Um, George has asked, if I can paraphrase, can you say anything about the ways in which you keep yourself safe when working as a, as a journalist in Myanmar, either physically or digitally, the ways that you try and keep your sources and your material and yourself safe? You, you mean like a, the previous time or current situation? Um, both. Right. Um, I can tell my uh, previous situation and then I, yeah. Um, so the previous uh, situation, I traveled multiple times, uh, not only in Rakhine, but also in the uh, ethnic conflict area, you know. So uh, basically for the Rohingya crisis, uh, my time traveling there is there has a potential um, risk. Uh, we know that, but I, I, I make sure uh, I make sure I have a local contest and, you know, to connect some, some people who can, uh, who can help me uh, for a couple of days for the reporting there. So uh, try, I need to make sure, I, I need to tell my editors that I, uh, I can go there and I, there is no any risk. I mean, it, there's a risk, but uh, less uh, risk than people who can help me for a couple of days and that harm, I managed to do, um, uh, you know, like um, safety issue is uh, difficult to um, difficult to explain that exactly what's going to happen to you or not, you know. So, at, so I, I when I was reporting about the Rohingya women who have been raped, they claim themselves uh, at least eight people on the ground. I, we wrote a story, wrote just uh, wrote a uh, published a story. Uh, our reporting, like uh, I, I got a multiple times, like uh, warning from the government officials, and you know, oh yeah, uh, they are not potentially threatened to me. Like, oh, why are we gonna arrest you? No, that's not like that. But they said, oh, they are reviewing or something like that. That how like uh, some kind of message we got. I got from the other side. Um, but uh, so the safety issues. Um, you know, I, I experienced as, you know, in, in jail, uh, I, I, I uh, like, I, I experienced, like, I, I went to the court and um, I, I've been sentenced of, for seven years, even we can prove that we did nothing wrong, you know, but I mean, I can say, fortunately, we, we released in 2019 before the, the serious situation happening right now. Um, so, you, you know, I cannot say um, a lot of people in Myanmar, they can guarantee themselves, they can stay safe or any, like a, the law can protect them or that's, that's, that's not like that situation. So, um, 
So currently, uh, many journalists have fled to, uh, to the neighboring country or they, they, some people stay reporting from the ground, like they, they are also looking at themselves for the safety situation, you know, they have to take care of themselves. They, 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 are, they are hiding and reporting and they're moving from another place to another place, that, that kind of situation. So safety, no guarantee, I think, yeah. And I wonder, did, would you say that you were treated better in prison because you were a journalist? And then also I'm wondering, did the international attention, the Pulitzer Prize, did that help? Did that help you in any way or did it not help and make things Oh, worse? definitely, of course. Um, I always thank people around the world who supported me, you know, especially Reuters, uh, they did an international campaign to release that. That much help. I mean, uh, mentally as well. I mean, in the prison, we heard about a lot of uh, people wishing us to release and demanding to, I mean, urge to the government and pressure. That definitely affect, I mean, uh, I'm, I always uh, think about it. Um, and, you know, maybe it is not directly proportioned that we were treated very, I mean, it's not very well. I mean, the, the, the prison environment um, that time, it depends on the whole political landscape and political situation in Myanmar. It's like, if the political situation is well, the prison situation is not much, uh, you know, not bad. Like ICRC also can, uh, can get access to the prisoners and giving the health cares and other treatments, you know. But now, like, I don't know, the, uh, I'm not sure how the prison situation, but, you know, like, I think definitely different uh, from what happened not on previous what we were. Okay. Um, look, look, Sangers, um, who's in the audience, has asked, did you, in, in your investigation into the, um, the Indian ma massacre, did you make use of any documents official documents or data, anything like that in your investigation? Uh, the, 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 the document about, so, I mean, basically I, I you know, I've got the two photos uh, and, <clears throat> and I've been there and I found the mass grave and I wasn't sure at that time, you know, I, I interview uh, a lot of people. I mean, we interview a lot of people, not only me, my, my colleagues and other Roche supporter. Uh, we did a, like a, a lot of uh, interview with the local peoples. And, you know, we are also, um, I'm also uh, interviewed with the police and the, I don't know what the, the so that the situation, we also um, uh, question to the government uh, about their response. That's how we wrote a story. Yeah. And I mean, finally, I, 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 I wasn't sure of the mass grave. I mean, like, I found a bone uh, sticking out of the ground that, like, we sent to the forensic guys and uh, forensic experts and what is, what is the situation. But uh, we, you know, like, um, we want to make sure every, every single corner that we suspect in, to prove that that's really these people were there. And and the fine, uh, the like uh, I, weeks later, when I came back from Yangon, that I've got the third pictures of you know mutilated bodies. Uh, that how we were sure that I definitely were there where I have been, and you know, so we try. I try to prove that. Uh, so the official accounts, like we we try and you know the military. Um, we did another reporting. Uh, I mean, not uh, the Pulitzer winning uh, story is not only my story, but also the other, like uh, another stories as well. So, you know, we did uh, a lot of uh, official accounts to put all together in this. I mean, we, uh, that's why I, you know, I, I, I was uh, make sure I wanted to get a lot of information from the police, especially who were on the ground. That how we did a story. Um, someone has asked. What do you think the future holds for, for Myanmar and presumably for journalists in Myanmar too then? Well, um, current situation, uh, the military uh, group uh, in, in February, as you know, uh, so there's opposition, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to, you know, against them, but it's the situation. Uh, a lot of people want to get, uh, 
peace and you know stable situation that we hope that in the near future uh, we hope that uh, the situation can be better but uh, you know it's difficult to say at the moment and can I ask a little bit about your situation? Feel free not to answer this, but I wonder whether you plan to go back to Myanmar and work there again um, as, a, as a journalist? I, you know, I, I am now working for Reuters uh, in Toronto. Um, I'm still learning a lot of things about, uh, for reporting, especially I'm now focusing on Myanmar issues. And um, I also wanted to work other, uh, like um, investigated um, <clears throat> stories uh, in Canada and, and global issues that because I want I'm a, I'm a, I grew up in Myanmar and I you know I had to, I have to learn a lot of uh, things I always joke uh, other people um, I was I was a fish in the river not in the sea you know the water is different so I need to I need to you know adjust a lot of myself. And I'm also studying at the University of Toronto in political science and still have to continue my study. I hope uh, one day uh, I can, you know, go there and do reporting like before. I really, I really wanted to work, uh, like going to the ground reporting and, you know, um, I, I always uh, dream about that. And can I ask about your colleague? Is your colleague back in Myanmar or? Or not, your colleague who won the prize with you? Uh, we are we are the same here. Yeah. So he he's in Toronto too. Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, okay. But I think that I think that I think that's all we have really in, in terms of, of questions for you. But um, thank you so much for your time, um, while and we're really grateful to have you. Um, and and we hope that you can we will continue working. Thank you for such a lyrical and insightful conversation about Myanmar, a place that we hear a lot about, but never really from, um, from, from, from first-hand sources. So we're extremely grateful for you for, for, to, 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 for, for, for sharing your time with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, James. And thank you for the people who listen here. Um, I hope it's going well um, because of my English and I'm still learning. Oh, it was, it was wonderful and really interesting. And, and so thank you so much, well, and I hope you keep in touch with us too. Thank you. Thank you. See you then. Thank, Bye -bye. thank you everyone for coming. I would like to remind you that this is only day one of four of the conference. So we have more exciting talks coming up and because it's online, we can have people from all over the world we normally can't afford to invite. So please do come. Uh, we have Ron Nixon tomorrow. We have uh, talks on Russia and uh, um, talks about Africa later on in the week. Please do come. There's a lot uh, of exciting stuff and please bring friends and share, share, spread the word. Thank you, everybody.